UK. And she will present to us the satellite data applications using um, computer vision techniques. Let's welcome Paula. So first, I'm going to present myself. So this is the best photo I could find. So I'm a technical manager in Deimos, UK. We are based in Harwell in the Oxfordshire. And uh, I studied originally in Spain telecommunications and then uh, started working in the space industry and got interested in Earth observation. And last year I decided to do a master's in computer vision because I thought there was a good match between computer vision techniques and the type of applications we were developing. So this is part of my dissertation which was finding the pose of a satellite when we are approaching it from another satellite. And uh, my interest is finding new applications for satellite data and then other, like basketball, photography, <laughs> not important stuff. So this is my presentation. <coughs> it's going to be more generic and maybe less less technical. I do mention some of the algorithms that we use, but I thought it was a good opportunity to give an idea of, I think we are an average company doing um, satellite applications, some research using computer vision for this, and uh, you can have an idea of, of the level of complexity of the things and of what challenges we, we face. So I'll give a, bit, a brief introduction, then I've, I've divided the applications into three main ones. Land cover, land use, agriculture and urban applications, and then some of the conclusions. So as an introduction, I'd like to talk about why I'm interested in this computer vision for satellite data applications. Basically it's because I've seen the volume of data that is delivered by satellite, satellites is increasing very, very fast. So if we look at this, on the, on the left, 2005, there were not many satellites, but most of them were governmental or military ones. Whereas in 2014, most of the satellites are, the green part is commercial. So there is a lot of data that now is available for people, for research, for, for companies, for projects. And for, from all that is um, estimated that 40% of those are Earth observation. So the data, is, is underexploited, but also there are so many opportunities to innovate and produce more applications. Uh, a little bit about Amos Space. So we are a subsidiary of a Spanish company of the Elecno Group, and we specialize on satellite software and system engineering. And uh, the whole company does everything on the space industry, from flight segments and uh, guidance, navigation and control, ground segment, you know, GNSS, satellite navigation, and Earth observation and satellite applications is our specialty here in the UK. We work mainly with Earth observation, uh, with sorry, uh, optical <coughs> images in the visible and non-visible spectrum, although we have also some experience with radar or SAR. So as an overview, I'm going to give some ideas of typical satellite data applications. Uh, one of them is classification, we want to classify, classify land, to know the extent of the different types or we want to extract the different types of materials on the Earth for that we can use hyperspectral remote sensing which give us more than just the RGB bands but other uh, bands, frequency bands where we can capture imagery or we want to find boundaries, uh, for example, between the land and the river or the sea and the land and this is very difficult because if you imagine yourself on the beach you don't know where the land finish and the sea starts so it's very important for cartography, for example, or we want to know where, is the, where the fire made an impact or how a city is growing. And of course, the big <coughs> nice thing about satellites is that there repeti there is repetition, so we can look at time series and changes. And apart from classification, we can go then into feature structure and counting. So I think counting is becoming a, a very interesting application for satellite. So we have people counting trees just to help maybe calculate an insurance value of a house or, or an area. There's people counting polar bears to see if there are enough of them. Is there the polar bear? One. There's um, some people trying to count uh, cars in a car park to see if the other supermarket is getting lots of clients and they are not, or mm, trying to estimate the yield, counting plants, or even counting graves in cemeteries. The, I took some of the applications from that website, and it's quite interesting website. There is <coughs> 100 things that remote sensing is doing for us. So let's go into detail on one of them. I wanted to start with land cover, land use, because I think it's the 
most well-known one, and uh, also one of the first ones I started using um, computer vision. So Corin is a is a map of uh, types of land that is created in a European way. It um, twelve countries are contributing to this map, and uh, it's basically the basic idea of if we know where are the forests, where are the lakes where are the different areas, then we can monitor, see the changes, are we growing too fast, are we destroying our forest. Now, to build this map, each country um, is, is responsible for its own, for its own map, and uh, for the UK, um, it's Leicester University produced the last map, and they use computer vision classification techniques. Now I wanted to, be, I wanted to talk about the challenges of building a map like this. And so everyone knows here a bit of classification techniques and uh, the ones that are more used. So the UK is very big. So <coughs> the, large, the area to cover is big and the number of images that you have to process to get this map here is loads. In fact, the data to build this map was collected over three years and processed over three years. And that includes trying to get coverage without clouds and things like that. The segmentation is a combination of the image segmentation but also using digital cartography to improve the results. And the optical data uses different sensors and super, or, uh, sensors and, and bands. So the acquisition, as I said, is quite difficult because of the cloud. So it's not a straightforward just classification because then you have all the images to put together and uh, the different dates and the different weather conditions on every day. And uh, as I said, the map for 2006 was released in 2012. So it's an idea of the, of the complexity. If we scale it down, for example, we have this um, project called Crop ID, where we are trying to classify all the crops in, in the UK as well. So we had partnership with Cranfield University and AHTV Horticulture, which are a government organization for horticulture. And we wanted to know where the distribution of the crops and um, what type of crops do they have in, in which area? This was our test area. Um, we, we started from the boundaries of each field in the area and some satellite imagery. We applied machine learning algorithms and then we get the most probable crop for each field. And a bit more detail, we got the boundaries from the Rural Payments Agency. For satellite, we got 22 meter resolution from Demos 1 and DMC 2 because it covers, one image covers most of the UK. We also tested in a smaller, in better resolution one like Rapida. And uh, what we do is we use three images through the year so that we can cover the beginning, the middle, and the end of the growing season. And uh, then we use supervised classification. Point out that we had to collect ground, ground data from <coughs> several fields. In our case, where 2,000 fields were visited to get, to get ground data for this classification. And uh, some of the algorithms used were support vector machine and random forest. These were the results. So in general, some of the crops were detected quite well. For example, uh, we have the peas or the sweet corn, the potatoes, the grass. This was mainly when the, when the ground data was good enough, then the results were quite good. But there were other, for example, I have the carrots and parsley. We only had 11 fields. So even when the detection was 100% accurate, we, we cannot say this is going to work or next time we can get <coughs> completely different results. So as you can see, the number of crops in the UK, there's lots of them and they were grouped as well <coughs> by logic groups, not necessarily by crops that look alike. So there are many ways of doing this grouping and improving these results. So once again, I want to highlight the challenges. Uh, the first thing is the survey data. So the ground data is very difficult and expensive to obtain. So in any satellite uh, applications, the images cover big areas and that is the advantage of it. But then when you want to validate your results, well, that's the disadvantage of it. And um, so we thought about maybe reusing tra training data from one year to another. Because, for example, for Crop ID, we have data from 2013, 2000 fields and imagery from that day. What happens if now we want to do a campaign next year? Is it possible to reuse? Well, it's, in principle, it's difficult as well, because uh, if I take images of the current cropping season in the same month so that I can compare my data, the crops might be in a different stage or in a different place or with different weather conditions. So I, I think there might be new 
more advanced uh, computer vision techniques that can be used to be able to compare that data and extract the real information from it, removing all of this extra noise. And uh, we had more challenges if we wanted to break down the crocs into other species, for example, the salads into lettuce, spinach. Or uh, we thought about adding SAR imagery, which is great that gives you more the, the texture and the height, so that could help the classification as adding another attribute to the table. And then uh, we have the approach when there's more than one crop in each field. So there's still challenges for segmentation. You have a, a field that you think is one, but it's really two. Can you detect that? Um, another one, and I guess this one goes back to the same problem I have always with ground data. We did this uh, environment monitoring in Mexico, and uh, it was the idea was to use optical images in this very nice area in uh, near Cancun. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to do was to uh, classify mangroves. There's the two types of mangroves here that I wanted to classify. These are those are mangroves, and these are dwarf mangroves. And they wanted to know the extent and the type. But they all only gave us these points as ground data. So there's four points for the dwarf mangrove and two points for the big mangroves. So we did what we could. So we took a couple of images. Two images of rapid eye from 2000. One was 2010 and the other one 2015. And each of them has five bands. Green, red, green, blue, red edge, and near infrared. And we added also these NDVI images. I don't know if anyone knows, is not familiar with NDVI. It's the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It tells you how, how green things are. For example, if we compare these two here, uh, on the right, you can see it's less green, so there's a loss of vegetation. So we built a new layer of information with this that might help us to classify our mangroves, because the big mangroves will be more vegetated, green. So we use a stack of 12 images to then class do the classification, and we use the sample points that we have to create some training data. So the result is this. Now, we know part of it is, is correct. The big areas in orange are small mangroves, and uh, most of the areas in green, that are especially the ones that are near the water, we know there are also big mangroves, but there are other points where we cannot, we cannot validate. <coughs> and um, when we go to our colleagues in Mexico and say, what do you think of this map? They say, we don't know, because you know, we wanted to know where the mangroves were, because we didn't know. So another challenge is the validation of the data, once again. So I'm going to move on to agriculture applications. Hopefully you're not yet lost, because I know there's lots of different things, and it was part of the idea to give ideas and uh, get inspire people to think or to, or to give solutions as well. So we have uh, a project called Cori. So it's about helping farmers and agronomists to better manage their crops. So the precision agriculture is becoming more and more important. You have your crop and you want to know where you want to put your, where, where you want to water your plants because they need it, if they need it. Where do you want to apply your pesticides? but now all over the crop, only targeted. So they use several types of sensors. One of them are mounted on tractors. That now they've started buying and operating their the UAVs or drones. And we are adding the extra layer of the satellite data that for big, uh, big fields, they can also give more information going in a repetitive way. So things that computer vision can help with. But obviously, the farmers are interested in their health monitoring, change detection, and planning where to put their things. These are images from the NDVI, by the way. But uh, they are interested in assessment of the yield or identifying weeds in crops. So this image here has some weeds. So the black dots are called black, black grass, and they are invading this field. So maybe there's a way of saying to the farmer, look, the, there's like something happening on corner on your field. Maybe you should look at it. And talking about assessment of yield, I was trying to do a very quick thing recently because they wanted to know how many plants they had. So we wanted to count how many plants there were. So we did a, a very, very simple approach of combining some plants to, to highlight the plants and mass them out and then separate the background from, from the, sorry, mass them by separating the background and foreground 
using those two techniques, based on to unify the image lightning and the auto stress we have to cut it automatically because this is another part of our challenges. We don't want someone to be doing this for each image. We want that every image that arrives is done automatically and uh, the process should work for most of them. And then we separate the blocks. And uh, I can tell you there are 1,500 plants because I counted them. <laughs> and the algorithm says there are 1,400. You can trust my, my vision more than the algorithm, but I just, I'm not sure what I would do. And, um, and this last one I was going to talk about in cultures, the UAB data. So interestingly, we had several uh, presentations about UAB mosaicing and uh, registration for registration is very important. So the farmers are buying UAVs and then they, are, they have suddenly a folder full of images, but no, a, an image of their field. So we are trying to, to do the mosaic as well. Eventually we bought a commercial software because it was easier for us. But um, <coughs> it's a challenging task in, here in agriculture because the, the, the fields are so similar. It's very difficult for the algorithms to find where the, the special features are to, to co-register. So that's not differentiating features. And it relies very often on the geographical information that the UAB is providing. So in this example here, the altitude fail and therefore we missed a part of the field that we actually have images for but it was not properly properly mosaic. So just wanted to mention it as a challenge that uh, if you have a field full of plants that all look the same, how do you co-register those images? And uh, my final type of application is going to be urban applications. So we have a, a big project going on which is called SAFI. Uh, it's to automate maps in Dubai using <coughs> high resolution satellite imagery. So Dubai is growing, it's growing so fast that uh, they don't have time to update their maps. So it takes them a year to, to get the, the new updates of the maps when the city keeps keep, keep, uh, growing. So we partner with the Mohammed bin Rashid Space Center and uh, we're trying to detect some of the new features appearing and some of them are vegetation water, especially swimming pools and artificial uh, lakes, buildings and uh, roads. So I'm going to talk about roads because it's the part we are working at the moment. Um, we, we start with the assumption that we know where some of the roads are and that's easy because we have in vector, vector format these roads. From, we can get it from the open street map or we can get it from, from Dubai municipalities. And then we're going to use this high resolution imagery from Demos 2 and Duvaisa 2, which is one meter resolution, and it has four bands. And the idea is every <coughs> time we receive a new image, we will detect the new roads, compa compare with the road network, and then find the differences. So this is uh, an example of the, of the processing chain. I go step by step. So we do some classification. At the moment, we're doing pixel classification. So we have a first end-to-end -end chain and our idea is then try to improve the different steps one by one. Um, we, do, we do some cleaning up of the results, we're trying to be a bit more clever and using directional filters to close some of the little gaps. For example, on the left we have a normal opening closing um, operation, morphology operation, and there were some of the roads that were broken, but when we use our directional filters, well, those, those gaps don't appear anymore, so it's good. We have more noise as well. But Next step is to do escalatonization and vectorization. So we thin the roads and then we try to vectorize to get that road network. And the next step for us is to try to clean up and be more clever and say, okay, this should be connected and then this should be completely straight. So vectorization is also a big challenge, by the way. <laughs> and uh, apart from this pixel classification, this is one of the work we'll be doing in what we could call uh, feature extraction and there's a runabout. We're trying to find the runabouts in Dubai as well so that we can add it to our map. And what we've done is create a feature descriptor which uh, is using Hog. It's able to classify uh, runabouts because Hog is very good with shapes and runabouts are round. So we get 100% of accuracy in our test data which is only, I think it's 40 runabouts and 40 non-runabouts. Sometimes, depending on the configuration, it gets confused with these ones here because they are round, although they are buildings. 
and this is an example of the detection on the image. Well, there is the big runabout is not detected. I think it's bigger than the window that we are using to detect runabouts, but it's also the first approach that we've taken, so we're quite happy with it to start with. And uh, another idea for this uh, computer vision in this type of applications is we know that there will be mistakes, there will always be mistakes, but how can, can we fix them? So we want to have maybe a semi-automated process with a human in the loop, but we want to make their life very easy. So if there be, there's been a mistake, and for example, that little island has not been detected, what about if the human input could help the algorithm to then rerun? If I click on there, so I'm giving a new point of information, now ground data, or just say, look at this area and reprocess this. Or I click on the middle of this runabout, and then my algorithm is able to say, okay, this is the round bit, these are the two rows that join. So we, we are working in this approach of the smart tool that also built on top of computer vision algorithms for image processing. And um, the last one I want to talk about is the 3D reconstruction. So I know there's a lot of experts in the, in the room. So we partner with the uh, University of Oxford. There, this is mainly their research I'm going to present very briefly. So I'm not an expert on what they've done. But uh, we have a stereo pairs of satellite images. So Deimos 2 is able to capture stereo pairs by on the same orbit, just picking, taking an image when he's going mm -hmm. and taking an image when he's leaving the, the sea, which is very good because it's on the same day. Uh, several minutes different, so and um, so we want <coughs> to try to reconstruct Dubai using that. So we are just studying the, the possibilities. Uh, one idea is using the typical stereo pair matching, the, the camera calibration, the, the triangulation. Uh, another way would be trying to use LIDAR, but then we would have to pay the LIDAR, the LIDAR campaign. Another way would be if we if we can detect the, the footprints of the buildings, then do extrusion using the, the height of the buildings as calculated with the satellite imagery. And the one that we are looking at was this computer vision techniques, uh, the Gaussian process, Gaussian process latent variable models that are based in, in deep learning and this um, latent space. <coughs> so we were interested in this one because it's a computer vision techniques that we're using for finding cars when we, they were when, uh, from a from a from a car they were driving and they were trying to reconstruct the environment and the cars had this uh, the shadow no, behind the car they couldn't reconstruct so they were saying okay if we know it's a car then we can put the <coughs> so uh, Dr. Victor Andrea Adrian Riscario <coughs> and Andrea Vedaldi of the Oxford University presented this paper to us and we said okay can you do the same with buildings so we gave them uh, models of buildings in Dubai. We, we decided we'll target the skyscrapers. skyscrapers. These are the buildings we gave them. And then they, they try to they train the algorithms to learn the concept of a building in this uh, latent space. And this is an example of reconstructed buildings using the parameters that the algorithm picked in one I don't remember how many dimensions he tried. They tried with different dimensions, so the more dimensions, the more similar the reconstructed buildings are to the real ones. So this is a visual um, representation of this latent space. So as you can see, as you know. so if you move through the space, then you would find the different types of buildings, the taller, the thicker, the round ones. So what did they achieve with this? So if we have um, a satellite image taken with an oblique angle, then uh, given the outline of the angle with only one image, they were able to fit a 3D model of the building on top of it that was quite close to the real one. And the same with this one. If you just tell the algorithm this should be a building, it's able to try to find and fit the best shape of the building that it can to this one. So, to finish, Hopefully I'm doing well in time, I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Some conclusions. Um, as I said at the beginning, the data I think is under-exploited and the algorithms are presented, I think they are relatively simple. So the market is growing very fast. So this is a projection and in 2012 there will be so many more satellites. It's growing every year, every year. And we have now also the small satellites, not only the traditional big and heavy geosatellites of the CubeSats, 
all the governments are putting money into this because they are very cheap to launch. They take now a couple of years and before they used to take 50 years to develop and launch. So market is growing and the data is becoming cheaper and of higher resolution. So if any of you have uh, algorithms that you think they can be applied to this type of applications, or if you have applications that now you think, oh, maybe I could use computer vision for it, we'd be very happy to, to look here and collaborate. So this is my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay. We still have time for questions. But I, I oh, sorry. Yeah. They have just a comment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, very interesting stuff. Urban objects um, and buildings and roads and traffic. Uh, for those interested in these topics, we have a conference, CMRT, City Models, Roads and Traffic okay. Reconstruction. Um, this last was last year, year in France, is 2018 in Hanover probably, and all proceedings can be downloaded by our web page from TU Munich. The check for CMRT 09, 05, and so on. You can download all proceedings. I'm going to ask you later. Okay. <laughs> but for all those interested in city models, roads, and traffic, there's a special conference on the ISPS conference. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Can I ask? You, you did mention the crop ID. Yes. Uh, uh, were you given any ground truths for the those ID, or in which way you can? Uh, distinguish between IDs based on satellite imagery. Yeah, so um, basically we created our own ground truth by sending a team to look at the fields and pick up data. In fact, it was Grantham University who did it for us. So it was 2,000 fields. So it's something that you cannot do every year. And uh, if you pay a company to do it, it's very, very expensive because they, they want to know. So that's the way we gather ground data. But then with the ground data, we saw that you can actually classify many of the crops, even if they are grouped in lettuce and uh, maybe but yeah, the more ground truth, the more better, better work here. Yeah. In the real um, classification, uh, did you use any specific method or just a normal classification method? <coughs> so we use normal method, methods with are random forest and uh, support vector machine and try to pick the best result every time. But I think the most interesting <coughs> thing is the, the time. So we don't only use one image, but we use from the same field three images through the growing season because that helps the separation of some of the some of the plants. Because if they grow faster or slower, you can see that as well. Or if they change color through the seasons, you can also. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mangrove example. We're just going on to ground truth. Did you? You were given a very small number of samples. Did you use those to? Uh, effectively guide to train your classifier or did you sort of try and do a classification and then look at them to see how well No, we, we trained with that because uh, yeah, it was the only information we had. So, yeah. <coughs> so yeah, typically for, for temporary uh, images as well, it's rather hard to communicate. So is there any method for the Can you the uh, How about the validation? Especially about the number Yeah. One. So that was the challenge, that's the difficult part. I cannot say my results are correct 100%. Other than if I, if an expert looks at the satellite image and says, okay, this area I know, and I know there are ma mangroves, or I know there are no mangroves, so it's not correct. But they cannot know every single pixel. So it's very difficult to validate. Some of the applications are very difficult to validate, and maybe no one will. So there's lots of people generating global maps of whatever, vegetation, global maps of trees. It's difficult. How, how are you going to go to every tree and say, oh, yeah, yeah, I was there. So, yeah, it's one of the things that you have to, yeah, it's difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Let's move to, yeah, let's move to our next system. <laughs> 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 <laughs>